And when you, when you look at the resistance to generosity. Yes. So, um, it's, and it's that's, that's what yeah. I, I find interesting. So it's not that we don't have often opportunities to be generous, but sometimes we choose not to be. And, uh, and this doesn't have to be huge, huge acts. Uh, it can be, you know, as you were saying, just um, choosing to smile or uh, to put someone at their ease or um, uh, to, to choose to take the time to look at something from a different perspective. Yeah, exactly. You're right. And it's the, it's the resistance to this which I think is really, really interesting. And that's where we need the kindness to ourselves because when we begin to see the resistance to this, then we see that pattern of, of um, thinking and being, uh, which is uh, not particularly complimentary. Mm. Uh, and so we need a, we need a kindness because um, often it's, um, it's become a habit. It's become a reflex. Um, and it might be around um, uh, concern that we might not have enough for ourselves or um, that we might be taken advantage of or um, uh, uh, an uncomfortable feeling if we, if we then uh, choose to take a different perspective. Um, and, and so this really moves the meditation into, into daily life. So I think generosity is a, is a great key for unlocking the practice in daily life itself. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely true. Sarah, hi. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> Can I? <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to share a, a, a couple of things this week uh, that I think this 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 talk for me is just so so perfect this week. And um, just picking up with something you were saying there around generosity. I think in family life, we're so entrenched in our patterns that often mm. it's not even visible to see how to do something generous. And I was with my parents earlier in the week and a conversation began that's quite a familiar one. And it was somebody in, in, in my, my family who was starting down a line of thinking that was quite... Um, critical, not of anyone in the group, but just more, more broadly judgmental. And I, I saw it beginning to roll out. And I, I, I did something different, which was very, which was interesting. So instead of adding into it, joining it, or becoming silent and withdrawing, because I didn't like it, I did a little intervention. And I got the person to swerve. And it was really nice. We sort of managed to, to that thought process went cool. And we got onto something else. And that felt like a very, um, yeah, so it's a new, it's a new uh, way of being in a, in a group. And the family groups can be very, very, very strong. So that you can not, you might start to see things, but you don't know how to do anything with them. But actually being generous in that moment with staying neutral rather than having your past reaction, you can do something that's positive and skillful that can help the other person move out of that mindset. So, exactly. and, then it happened, yeah. and it happened again in another context with a, the with a mood the other day. And usually I'd have responded quite, um, well, in fact, I did start to respond a bit grumpily, but then, <laughs> but then I caught my own reaction happening, allowed it to drop. And then I was able to generate loving kindness to the person who was in the mood. And right. then their mood began to shift. And then I was able to, ex in fact, this, there was a space available to explain what I was doing rather than, rather than being, why are you smiling? That's annoying. Because <laughs> that sometimes happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But actually, yeah. This, this time, it was, it, was, it was really, really good. And it really worked. And, 
and, and balance was restored and everyone saw that balance came through in the group. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, very, um, it's a very, very powerful practice to apply it in daily life. Really difficult when you're in very strong programs, particularly the family ones. But if you can stay present and neutral, like you've been describing in yourself, there's mm -hmm. a window to have a different behavior. And mm -hmm. that's the, the generous and positive behavior that just, just can be quite spontaneous as long as your intention is. Yeah, is, it, is really, on, on it really mark. can. And, and what you're uncovering is you're going, what's happening to you is that you've been practicing for a pretty long time. And now what's happening is you are sensing, you are sensitive to the other person's craving mm -hmm. and you're being sensitive to the rising up of the tension and tightness and the other person who starts to crave and go into the negative, mm -hmm. into the negative. And you can see where may, the, you're also discovering the power that is behind loving kindness and compassion is much more powerful. When we look at, for instance, uh, the uh, vibrational levels or the frequencies, we look at the frequencies of these things. There was, uh, there was one in um, Power Versus Force in that book, the new, the new version of Power Versus Force. And in that, in that one, uh, there's a chart. And he was interviewed recently. The author was interviewed about this. And he said, you know, COVID-19 is like about a five or six. And uh, loving on a frequency base, you see. And loving kindness or, or for, uh, loving kindness, forgiveness, uh, compassion are up 120, 125. And they, they, they seem to understand that in order to wipe out COVID, if the person comes up into the levels, the higher levels working and they can't get COVID because COVID will get killed off at 15. It's about five or something like that. And it'll get killed off at 15 frequency. So what is this business of frequency throughout your body is if you're living loving kindness, you're making a decision to live loving kindness through everything that you're doing. And I'd like to turn it around, say, let's, when we're confronting, we're confronted with something, forgive it right away and take compassion by definition and give the person space to do whatever they have to do in front of you, but not be touched by it at all, because you don't take anything personally. You just decide, okay, it's an anatta experiment here. <laughs> I'm the anatta doll, and I'm just going to stand here and let the person let it rip, okay? <laughs> But I'm going to stay with the frequencies inside of forgiveness, loving kindness, and compassion. Mm -hmm. And then I might sit there and say, yes, yes, yes. I don't have to agree with them or comment back. And then it cancels out the person completely. Yeah, it can shut the person down. You saw a shutdown happen where the other person turned off in front of you. And then there you were with the positive keep doing it, keep practicing it is my advice. Now, but we all have stories about this, but I had a, a, a thing happen where um, a person was being really mean and nasty and towards another person at a table once. And when that was happening, one person injected in this positive stuff. And I just sat there in awe of this injection of positive, turned the person off. How did they do it? They simply asked a question, by the way, how are your children? How are they doing in school? And the person left the attack on the other person and jumped into bragging about their children in school and how they were doing. Fantastic example, right there in front of you. And what we're seeing is um, the, the conquest of this higher frequency against the lower frequency, which are all the negative, unwholesome mind states doing wrong thing, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong everything, and canceling it out. What we're looking for is confidence to go out and test it and use it. Yeah.
And that's what, that's what you did. That's good. Yeah. What? Yeah. Just a couple of really simple things. My, my daughter is uh, one of my daughters. Well, both my daughters are great inspiration, but a couple of small things. So I, I used to say, um, have quite a, a mean, mean way of being if someone else was making a drink. So I mentioned this because this is so easy to bring into everyone's daily life. And oh, haven't you made me one? That's what I used to do. It's really negative and grumpy. And then my daughter showed me how to do it properly. And she would come in and go, her face bright and shining. Oh, tea, how lovely. And so, of course, the person would respond with me going, would you like one? And it, oh, yes. And everyone felt so bright. There was no kind of miserable, oh, you've left me out again. You didn't make me one. How wonderful. And then she did something with Hugh, didn't she, the other day? I can't remember what it was. Hugh, Hugh hadn't done something. He'd missed something out. And, um, and she said, um, I'll let that slide this time. But next time, you'll add it in. <laughs> she's in the room now <laughs> and we all laughed it's just great and it's just this change of the way that we can say things that can have a generous intention behind it and the exactly. result that spreads everyone is happy it's it's really it's really good and then sometimes you'll have around who's like that follow follow yeah. them Sometimes I'll have this situation in a coupleship. Um, you know, sometimes I do blessings for weddings and there's four or five different things. I think there's five pieces on it. And um, one of the things is about respecting the other person and, and, and communication and sharing time and then, uh, you know, having them as a friend, but then having love in the relationship too. Those are like the five pieces. And part of it has to do with altruistic joy. And um, altruistic joy needs to exist in a relationship. When I got a chance one time to interview at least 20 along this highway, you know, places we were stopping crossing the country and we asking these elder people who were celebrating um, 70 year marriages. So they had gone through the Great Depression. The question was, how did they stay together for so long? It was this altruistic joy and a sense of humor with everything that was going, a sense of humor. I mean, can you imagine they took the farm, they came, they crashed the mortgage, took the animals, took the feed, took the equipment, and they end up living in a truck. And they're talking about having a sense of humor and staying together no matter what. You know, and I'm listening to these stories are just amazing, you know, of what they went through. But um, altruism is something that can be in one person. And someone said, but if the it's in me, but it's not in him or it's in him, but it's not in me, what do we do? And what you're talking about is an example of it. We, we train the mind, we purify the mind and train the mind systematically by learning how to change our habits and change the way we are working. And so we have this new uh, neurocognitive science that's telling us that you have this flexible neural pathway, neuroplasticity situation and you know the the brain can change so there's no excuse anymore you know there's no excuse to, well i can't change i'm not that way somebody here is probably sitting there inside them saying well i hear her story but i'm not that way she's that way but i can't be that way but that's not true because you can train yourself and then it gets fun if you're both working at that and feel you were feeling the other person in that situation. You were seeing what they needed and you were supplying it. That's living Buddhism. See, that's living the practice. I wish, well, that's what I call engaged Buddhism. Engaged Buddhism has some other kind of, uh, some other kind of thing where you're supposed to get involved in politics or everything too or something. I don't remember, but my idea of, uh, interactive engaged Buddhism, maybe I should say it that way. You just practiced interactive engaged Buddhism. <laughs> it's great. One of the things that was happening in the, um, I guess the 80s, about the 80s, 
well, I guess the seventies was there was a lot of working out in psychology. There were some topics in the American Psychiatric Association, and there were also uh, one year there, there was topics about um, mother-daughter, father-son relationships. And that was one of the topics one year. And so people got into this. And one woman wrote an article in the Midwest of the United States. She and her mother didn't get along well at all for many, many, many years. And um, it was because of her article that I started, I wasn't in as bad shape as she was with her mom, but I was in not really in great shape and I wanted to see what would happen. What she did was she made a commitment to sit down uh, two or three times a week with her mother for about two hours and do what's called yes therapy yes therapy and the way she kicked it off was she went started the objective of this practice she was doing was an attempt to hear her mother's life story and how many of us have heard our mother's life story when you step back you think about it you really probably don't even if you grew up beside your mother as a child here you probably don't know the real story of her whole life, unless you did this. And by doing that and just making a commitment not to object to anything the person says, even if you're involved in the statement and just yes, therapy, yes, yes. And you listen and listen and listen. It's a huge listening practice. And you come out the other end much more personally aware and, and sensitive to the behavior of your mother has been for you growing up and the problems that you've had. Because all of a sudden you know the truth of what happened when she was very young and her father died, for instance, or the Swiss coach said to the family, uh, she's good enough to be a swimmer in the Olympics. We'd like to take her on the Swiss team and train her, okay? and. The grandmother comes and says, oh, no, you won't do that in this day and time. Women don't do that. No, no, no. And take it away from her at 15 years old. You see? So you never knew any of these things. You didn't know that someone incredibly rich and famous had, you know, um, proposed to this person when she was about 17 and she said no uh, because of the prejudices of her family which was not her prejudice but because of the prejudice in her family against that marriage she turned it down and this the sadness that comes out of this is amazing but to understand the there's a real basis for it when you're a young person growing up with your your parents and there's something going on you you don't really know you think you do but you don't <laughs> you know that's what happens and the yes therapy puts a whole new shed of light and the what happened was she was so much kinder to her mother and patient after that it wasn't like she said yes i agree with you she just listened and finally heard all the, the way it was for her. And this is, a, at that time, this was a person that went through World War One, uh, World War II, lost the grandparents in World War One, and then later lost the sons in uh, World War Two, and just had horrendous, horrendous history that you didn't know anything about and how we presume. So there you are, you're in a bad situation and why? Are you in the bad situation? How are you there? Because you took an assumption and accepted it as a fact and then made up a story and got angry and lived that way without finding out real information. You made an assumption and took action in your behavior. Yeah. I've told many people that story, mothers and children sitting there side by side, and the kids really open up a little more to having a little more patience in the situation.